Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash I Know Dino. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And you can find out more at audibletrial.com slash I Know Dino. This week we have an interview with Mark Hallett and Matthew Wadel. We have Dinosaur of the Day Apatosaurus, and we have a bunch of dinosaur news. But as always, first we would like to thank some of our Stegosaurus patrons, and this week we would like to thank Chris, Nicholas, Blaze Campbell, Trent Carbajal, Paralora Lofus, <laughs> and Stefan. That name never gets old. It really doesn't. Thank you so much to our Stegosaurus patrons, and also to all of our patrons. We've had a really great year. This is our last episode of 2017, which can't believe it. The end of the year especially went by really fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had grand plans for different things we could do for like holiday stuff for Patreon. We just couldn't get it done in time. Maybe next year. Yeah. <laughs> we do have the book coming out, the top 10 dinosaurs of 2017, which will be free for everyone at the Tyrannosaurus level and above. And Eventually, there'll be an audiobook version as well. That you can find on Audible. Yeah, or if you're at the Spinosaurus level, you get that for free there. Yep. And you might have noticed that I have a little bit of a cold, as just about everyone gets in the winter. So, sorry if my voice sounds terrible. Or maybe it's more soothing, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Garrett will be editing out the coughs, so don't worry about that. Yeah, true. <laughs> Not all podcasts do that. I'm always surprised when I hear a cough in a podcast. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Get it together. So jumping right into the news, we have another new dinosaur, which, as Sabrina mentioned, since this is the last episode of the year, it'll be our last new dinosaur of 2017, bringing the total count to 42. Epic. I think that's the highest it's ever been. I think we're usually in the 30s. Yeah, since we've started doing this. Yeah, and it might be the highest ever, ever, because around the mid-90s, I think they were only up to three or 400 total dinosaurs oh, wow. named. <laughs> so 42 in a year is pretty crazy. <laughs> so this dinosaur was described by Rui Pei and others, and it was found in Mongolia in the Jadokta Formation at Uka Tolgad, you might recognize that name because it's the same as Halskaraptor, which we talked about last week. And that puts this in the late Cretaceous, about 75 to 70 million years ago. Fortunately, unlike Halskaraptor, this one wasn't smuggled around, but it was originally found quite a while ago, around 1993, in fact, with a joint expedition with the American Museum of Natural History. It just kind of was assigned a few different places and people had ideas about where it should fit but it hadn't been formally described until now so now that they described it they realized that it should be its own genus it's a troodontid and they say it's at least the fifth troodontid from the area and it's named almas uka and almas is apparently in reference to a wild man or snowman hmm. from Mongolian mythology, which I really like. That's I, cool. I guess it's like a yeti kind of thing. Okay, yeah. Sno wild snowman. And then Uka refers to the locality of Uka Tolgad. So there you go. Makes sense. Like I said, it's a troodontid, which means it's small. And because it's so small, it's easy to find more of the bones. <laughs> it's not like a titanosaur where you'd need like a football field to have enough space for all the bones. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, they did find a nearly complete skeleton, or in paleontological terms, a almost fully articulated skeleton. When I was looking at the skeleton, the only thing that I could see that was missing were the ends of the limbs. So basically the claws I didn't see anywhere. But I'm wondering if maybe it's in the Matrix because it's still partially in a jacket. So there's still a lot of rock around it. So I guess there's a potential that part of it's still buried. Mm -hmm. 
And then there's also a couple little pieces of the skull that aren't there. But there's plenty of skull around to be able to make a lot of inferences about what the species is. And you can see all its little tiny troodontid teeth that are <laughs> like a millimeter or two long. It just looks like, it basically reminds me of a bird with little tiny teeth or something. Mm. Yeah. It's, I guess that's scary. I was going to say that sounds cute, but then, yeah, you put it into perspective for me. No. No. <laughs> They say that it has many derived features like other late Cretaceous troodontids. Not at all surprising because we're almost at the end of the dinosaur era. And given the formation it's in, we know that it lived alongside Velociraptor and Protoceratops. That's pretty cool. It was also found with some eggshell, which they describe as prisma tulithid. Right, because ulithid refers to eggs, right? Yeah, fossilized egg genuses or genera. And the eggshell might be from Almas, but they're not sure. It could be from some similar dinosaur too. So there you go. That's lucky number 42. Almost as many dinosaurs as U.S. presidents. It's going to say the same number of dinosaurs is the answer to life. Yep. And all things. <laughs> so maybe Almas is the answer to life, the universe, and everything. <laughs> <laughs> i have to ask Douglas Adams. So next, this one's pretty cool. Senator Kurt Bramble from Utah has drafted legislation to change the state fossil from Allosaurus to Utah Raptor, and it's because of 10-year-old Kenyon Roberts, who asked him about it when Bramble was a guest for dinner one night. Mm. <laughs> Good for Kenyon. So Kenyon's reasons to switch the state fossil to Utah Raptor, it's got the name Utah in it, it's only found in Utah, and it helped out Jurassic Park because we've talked about this before. The Velociraptors were much smaller in real life. And then the discovery of Utah Raptor happened around the time the movie was being made. And that showed that raptors could be larger. So that kind of saved them. Yeah. Otherwise, that would have been a pretty ridiculously scaled up <laughs> yeah. Velociraptor. <laughs> so Kenyon got to review an early draft of the bill. And then Jim Kirkland, who is the one who discovered Utah Raptor and named it, said that he's supportive of, of the bill, which makes sense, <laughs> but there are historical reasons for keeping the Allosaurus. So he's in general supportive of all this because it's dinosaurs and Utah Raptor, but he does think that Allosaurus is important because there's the bone bed in the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry. Oh, good point. Yeah. Also, the first Utah state paleontologist, Jim Madsen, was the world's authority on Allosaurus. So there are connections there. Yeah. Well, the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry is pretty awesome. That's that what they think is a predator death trap. A mystery. Yeah. Because yeah. it's like 70 or 80 percent Allosaurus. <laughs> That's where we first heard about float and bloat. Bloat and float. Bloat and float. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta bloat before you can float. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I actually really like that, uh, knowing that connection, because otherwise it does seem like there's at least two or three dinosaurs with Utah in the name. So it makes sense to make one of them the state dinosaur, but Allosaurus is pretty awesome and has a lot of connections to Utah. So. Well, so Jim has a compromise that he's proposed, and it's that you keep Allosaurus as the state fossil, and then you name Utah Raptor as the state dinosaur, because they don't yeah. have a state dinosaur yet. That is a good move, doing separate fossils and dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And other states have already done that, so yep. there's a precedent. We'll see what happens. I just thought it was really cool that this all came out of a 10-year-old who's really into dinosaurs. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And some less exciting happy news. In Inverloch, near Melbourne, Australia, there's some vandals that damaged a 115-million-year-old dinosaur footprint. And the footprint is in the Boonurong Marine... Marine Park at Flat Rocks, and someone or some ones had used a hammer on the footprint at the Dinosaur Dreaming Site, which, by the way, really cool name, mm -hmm. and it's one of the few Ice Age dinosaur sites. So park rangers found out when they took a school group there on a field trip, and the footprint was found in 2006, and Museum Victoria and Monash University made a silicon rubber mold of the print and then left the track there so that visitors could enjoy it. Seaweed grows on the rock where the print is, so it blends in well, and you kind of have to know where to find it. So whoever did this knew where it was. Mm. And broken pieces of the print have been found, so that's good. It's not all gone, I guess. 
It's not clear what type of print this was, some sort of theropod, they think possibly megalosaurus. And hopefully they'll be able to piece it back together. You know, they're, they're working to restore it now. Yeah, that's lame. Mm-hmm. But in happier news, <laughs> thought I'd get that one out of the way. <laughs> There's some news about Dippy the Diplodocus. So he is in the process of getting restored, which you may know if you've heard us in previous episodes. And his two front feet have been replaced with hands, which is more accurate. So according to Paul Barrett from the Natural History Museum in London, quote, Dippy is actually five different sauropods <laughs> cobbled together, but they never had Diplodocus hands, so they just make copies of the feet. Dippy would have walked on the tips of his fingers in a sort of graceful ballet step, quote. <laughs> <laughs> so when he goes on his tour, he'll be more accurate. But if you happen to be visiting the museum, you won't be missing out because they're planning on having a life-size replica Dippy stand outside the museum. So that's nice. Oh, is that a permanent thing, do you think? It sounded like it. Oh, that's cool. It was just kind of a end note at the end of the article. Huh. That's interesting that they say replica Dippy because Dippy was already a replica. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> replica of a replica. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they start losing resolution at a certain point. I just think it's easier to make a replica of a replica that's made out of five composites. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Luke for this next one who shared it with us via Patreon. So Luke has a website, Jurassic Files, and we've mentioned his website a few times on the show, and they recently posted another article, this one about the museums of Western Colorado. The article is an interview with Dr. Julia McHugh, curator of paleontology at the museum, and we'll post a link like usual so you can read the full article, but the gist is that they have a lot of really cool facilities and sites. They've got three major museum facilities, four active paleontology sites, an education center, a research library, and archives. And they also have Dinosaur Journey, which showcases plants and animals that lived in the area 150 million years ago. The museum's also a repository for a lot of institutions, so it sounds like they have a lot of space. Mm. And they also make documentaries, which are posted on their YouTube channel. And next summer, they're planning on having a new exhibit called Horns and Frills about, you might guess, ceratopsians. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah, Western Colorado also has a lot of those scrape markings that we've talked about, mm -hmm. where it's like dinosaurs scratching at the ground. Oh, and yeah. They, mating maybe displays. Dancing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> In Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, the Cranbrook Institute of Science has a new exhibit called Dinosaurs and Fossils, and it's part of the Explore Lab area. And part of the exhibit lets kids use paleontologist tools to dig up casts of fossils. And there's also a paleo portal where you can see the ongoing process for fossil conservation. And you can buy tickets for the Explore Lab for Saturdays and Sundays. They cost $5 in addition to regular admission, which I think is $13. I've got a few more museum news. So from now until January 15th, you can see dinosaurs around the world at Imagination Station <laughs> in Toledo, Ohio. There's 13 animatronic dinosaurs and interactive stations where you can sculpt fossil replicas and rub imprints from bones. And it costs an additional $9.50 on top of the general admission, which is about $12 to see the exhibit. Also in January, on the 13th, Saturday, Lizardro Museum in Elmhurst, Illinois, is hosting Dinosaur Bingo at 2 p.m. You can learn about fossils there. It costs $5, and it's meant for kids in third to fifth grade, but adults are welcome. Cool. Yeah, sounds fun. I wonder what they do. Maybe it's like, rather than bingo, dingo or something. <laughs> they mentioned something about trilobites, so it's not just dinosaurs. Okay. <laughs> Trilo? You gotta have that six letters, right? Or five letters? Oh, I don't think it's a letter thing. I think the cards might have pictures of fossils or something. Ugh. I don't know. A total speculation on my part. Yeah. If anyone is uh, in Elmhurst, Illinois, January 13th, let us know. Or you have to get the shape of a dinosaur on the bingo card. Like that you could do seems, a tridactyl print kind of mm, thing. That seems unnecessarily complicated. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> and last in museum news... The Carnegie, or Carnegie, depending where you're from, Museum of Natural History visited Yo Intermediate Middle School in South Huntington, Pennsylvania, and it was part of a pilot program for 5th to 8th graders, and they brought in this 10-foot-tall mechanical Anzu Wiley puppet to interact with the students, and then museum staff also answered questions. And the, Sounds cool. Yeah, there's a short little video, and they have a clip of a student interacting, and they look like they're really enjoying it. 
Yeah, Ansu is a pretty awesome dinosaur. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's kind of like the T-Rex puppet at the L.A. Museum, but... There's a guy a, in it? It's a guy in thing? It. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so very interactive. Since it was a pilot program, maybe they'll be t- doing it in other schools later. Mm-hmm. That would be a fun one, too, to be in, because if you did it right, you could have your arms, like, in the wings. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Because <laughs> it's kind of like human size, plus the neck sticking up above. Oh, that would be weird, balancing that neck. Yeah. <laughs> so this next one was, is really adorable. There's this Scottish paleontologist and author, Dougal Dixon, who brought to life a group of kids' dinosaur drawings. So it was actually part of this promotional campaign by Great Bean Bags, <laughs> and the results were really cool. So kids drew dinosaurs, and then they just scribed them, and then Dixon turned them into what I, they look like 3D models. I think they're 3D models, like 3D models on a screen. And then he also says if these animals could have existed. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're very imaginative. So the, in the article I read, there's five drawings they pointed out. There's Como Triceratops, which is this bluish, purplish, friendly, helpful herbivore that could blend in with mountain mists. Then there's Tuasaurus, which is a two-headed green theropod <laughs> with yellow stripes that eats other dinosaurs and has a loud roar. And it would have killed its prey, but they would have had a hard time deciding which head would eat it. <laughs> and then there's the Fish River, which is a yellow pterosaur. I know, not a dinosaur, but still. And it can't fly, but it rules the shallow part of the sea and eats lots of fish. There's also Flinosaurus, a rainbow-colored ankylosaur-like dinosaur that lets other animals live on him, and then he keeps them safe. Yeah, I like that one because there were all alternative explanations by the paleontologist. And for that one, he said that he got like animals stuck to him and then (laughs) used them as like a shield kind of thing or like rolled around in rocks or something and the rocks got stuck to him as armor. (laughs) So (laughs) there was always the kid's explanation and then the paleontologist's explanation of this drawing where the paleontologist would try to like incorporate some sort of real mechanism to how it might, how you might have something similar in real life. Yeah. It's pretty clever. Yeah. And then the last one was... Polyosaurus bananasaurus, <laughs> <laughs> which is a giraffe-colored sauropod that's sad because she likes snow, but it's summertime, and she has 12 legs because she likes to dance. Yeah, <laughs> that one had a good explanation, too. They were like, it's a crab, but it's simulating a dinosaur or something yeah. with like one limb sticking out to the side pretending to be a head and then something on the other side pretending to be a tail yeah because otherwise how could you explain all these extra legs on a dinosaur (laughs) (laughs) that was a pretty good one it was the name too sounds very dinosaur named Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah those are pretty fun yeah i think there was a contest too where a lot of people sent in drawings and then they only reviewed like the best five kind of thing yeah that sounds right and those five were really creative. Mm-hmm. Good for those kids. <laughs> and speaking of kids and dinosaurs, the New York Times published a review of Timeless Diego and the Rangers of the Vast Atlantic by Armand Baltazar. And I think we talked about this book before it was published. It would have been a while ago. But this is a middle grade book for ages 8 to 12, though I bet it's good for adults too. And I plan on getting a copy sometime <laughs> in the near future, Garrett. <laughs> It's 600 pages. There's a lot of illustrations by the author, and in it, quote, people from every era coexist with dinosaurs and giant robots, end quote. So the main character, Diego Rivera, has just turned 13, and his father, Santiago, has reinvented a lot of their world after this time collision, which I guess you hear more about in the book. Hmm. And Santiago gets captured by some people, so it's up to Diego and his friends to rescue him. And there's scenes, it sounds like, with World War II fighters, robots, and pteranodons, and herds of dinosaurs in cityscapes. So, sounds like a really enjoyable read. Cool. Slash, I guess you'd enjoy the illustrations as well. In game news, there's another dinosaur park sim game coming out. Oh, good. We needed more. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Somebody on our Facebook posted about, yeah, there's been a lot of sim games lately too. (laughs) So I don't know if this one will get that many players or publicity. Yeah. (laughs) 
But anyway, Shadow Raven Studios is fundraising on Kickstarter for Prehistoric Kingdom, and this will let you build a dinosaur park and even experiment with dinosaur DNA. And currently, you can play the game for free, and there's a demo on Steam if you want to check it out, which is why I mentioned. (laughs) Nice. I think I might have heard of that one. I think that one was supposed to be pretty good. There are some that are really realistic. I'm not sure if it's that one, but... Some of them are way more on the Jurassic Park side and other ones are more on the, you know, realistic dinosaur side. Well, if you can experiment with DNA, it sounds more Jurassic Park side. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of necessary in any of them. Yeah. But yeah, I suppose if, depending on how they phrase the dinosaur DNA, definitely at least a little sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> also in game news, thanks to Matthew for sharing with us on Facebook an update to the dinosaur models that's happening in Ark Survival Evolved. So he sent us these two T-Rex models, and one of them is the new model and one of them is the old model, and asked which one is more realistic. And (laughs) at first glance, I couldn't really tell much of a difference because they both have a lot of weird things that are pretty unrealistic. (laughs) For example, they're both covered in what looks like osteoderms down their sides, but they're, it's like, it reminds me actually of that ankylosaurus kid drawing where Mm -hmm. it has like rocks stuck to it because that's what it looks like. (laughs) They don't look like actual osteoderms. And then down its back, it's got like another series of some kind of spines or something going on, which is kind of unusual. And there's no feathers on it, which is potentially okay based on depending on which scientist you want to listen to. But it does have some weird horns on its head, above its eyes especially, and horns do fossilize in general, at least the horn cores. So that's kind of out of nowhere. And they have pronated arms, meaning they look like they'd be more likely to do a push-up than give something a hug, (laughs) which is obviously wrong. We talk about pronated arms a lot. It's kind of that... You know, the typical T-Rex arms that people do when they're pretending to be a T-Rex mm-hmm. <laughs> is is pronated when they shouldn't be. Um, Garrett is doing T-Rex arms yeah. as he says this. <laughs> <laughs> like trying to grab at something on a table in front of you. <laughs> yeah. But there are a couple updates that make it look a little more realistic. They made the skull a little bit more proportionally accurate. It's a little shorter than it was before. And they also seem to update the teeth Before, the teeth kind of look like a Carcharodontosaurus or something, where it's a lot of small, sharp teeth, Mm -hmm. and the new ones have that sort of characteristic T-Rex, where some of the teeth are longer and the premaxilla is a little shorter and all that kind of stuff. They definitely stand out more, those teeth. Yeah. So, I think it's a good update. It still has a long ways to go if they're trying to be realistic, but I don't think ARC has ever really tried to be realistic, so. I wonder what the motivation was here. I think they're partly updating the models to make them like higher resolution and at the same time decided to, you know, change up the style a little bit. Hmm. But cool. It's definitely better. Still very far from realistic, but you know, take what you can get. (laughs) Better than I can draw. Yeah, me too. (laughs) (laughs) And last, because I love these stories of people who do stuff in in the inflatable T-Rex costume. So there's this dad in Louisiana who put on the inflatable T-Rex costume. His is green. I don't know how you find different colors for that. But anyway, he danced around waiting for his middle school daughter to come home from school. And when she got off the bus, he chased her towards the house. (laughs) (laughs) And supposedly she was very embarrassed, which makes sense. She's in middle school. So she was running away because she was embarrassed, not because she was scared. (laughs) Mm, It's hard to tell from the video. (laughs) <laughs> that's funny could be a mix of both yeah <laughs> and before we get into our interview we want to take a minute to thank our sponsor audible as a reminder they have lots of audio books that you can choose from they say over 180,000 titles i keep looking for an update because it seems like they must be over 200,000 by now but i can't find an up-to-date <laughs> listing on the number of titles most of the time when I look for an audiobook and, you know, you search for it on Amazon or whatever, you get an audible version of it. So it seems like just about any modern book and a lot of more popular older books have been created on Audible. So that's really helpful. Mm-hmm. We also have a book on there. It's our kid's book, What Happened to Brontosaurus. Yep. And we have started recording our other books. I think we're done recording 
one of the top 10 dinosaur books, but we just haven't finished editing it yet Mm -hmm. because there are extra requirements for audible editing that I need to figure out. (laughs) (laughs) And then eventually we'll have all of our top 10 books on audible too. And then as a reminder too, you can get the audio books when they come out by joining at our Spinosaurus level on Patreon. But in the meantime, if you're looking for a good audiobook over the holiday break, if you have a break, <laughs> <laughs> you should check out audibletrial.com slash inodino. And now on to our interview with Mark Hallett and Matthew Wadle. Today we are lucky enough to be able to chat with Mark Hallett and Matt Wadle, who are the creators of the book, The Sauropod Dinosaurs, Life in the Age of Giants. And Matt is an associate professor of anatomy at Western University of Health Sciences. And he's also a vertebrate paleontologist who studies sauropod dinosaurs and the evolution of pneumatic bones in dinosaurs and birds. He's co-authored the papers that have named the dinosaurs Sauroposidon, Brontomeris, and Aquilops. And he co-founded the website Sauropod Vertebra Picture of the Week. And Mark is a paleo artist and author whose work has been featured in Life, Smithsonian, Natural History, and National Geographic magazine, as well as books, art galleries, and museums all over the world. He was also the artist consultant for the movies Jurassic Park and Dinosaur. Wow, that's nice. Thank you. Thank you. So the book Sorva Dinosaurs, it came out last year, was published by Johns Hopkins University Press. It's one of my favorite dinosaur books because not only have you got these. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for well, making thank you it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and also, we have a signed oh. copy because we met you at the tail at end SVP, of SVP. I yeah. I'm, I'm pleased that you came by and I'm happy that you like our book. It's uh, as packed with science as we could possibly make it. And both Matt wanted it to be extremely accessible to the average paleo enthusiast, especially um, those who are interested in sauropods, as well as just the specialists themselves. So uh, that's really a very nice compliment. Thank you. Yeah, I, I that was my feeling exactly reading this. was like, this is a really great introduction to sauropods, but also just dinosaurs overall. So if you're even if you're just kind of stepping into, just starting to embrace your enthusiasm... <laughs> <laughs> well, you uh, you find uh, I, I'm sure Matt would agree that you really can't talk about sauropods without talking about other dinosaurs because they were an interacting community of creatures, mm-hmm. and uh, sauropods evolved in the presence and uh, partly from the pressure exerted by other sauropod uh, taxa that uh, that created uh, the way they were and their in relationship to the environment. Yeah, definitely. So how did the two of you decide that you wanted to make this book and that you were going to work together on it? I have uh, vivid memories of meeting you at a a SVP in a galaxy far away in a time long ago, but I can't (laughs) quite remember which one it was. That was probably about 1998 or so. And Uh I met Mark at my first or second one and we got to talking. I had been, I had known who he was since I was nine years old from, um, (laughs) from looking at dinosaur books. And he was one of my favorite artists. So I met him, we got to talk, and he found out that I was working on sauropods. And even way back then, this was 98 probably, he said that he wanted to do a really big, lavishly illustrated book on sauropod dinosaurs. And I kept up with him at the meetings, and I guess it was probably about 2011 that Mark gave me a call and said, hey, I'm rolling on my sauropod book. <laughs> And mm-hmm. basically invited me to be a part of it. So that was a dream come true for me. Well, it was a dream come true for me, too, because I would heard of uh, Matt and his work for some time. And um, I just sensed that uh, he and I could be good working partners. And he certainly uh, turned out to be very much so. And um, I think we were an excellent team together. We helped each other and uh, we meshed very well. I think we both share the same enthusiasm for the animals about their paleobiology and what makes them so distinctive. So it was a a very good partnership, I think. That's great. So why sauropods specifically? Well, uh, to start off with, uh, in my case, I think that there's just something about their overall look and size and uh, they have just been the most incredibly majestic, wonderful dinosaurs I could 
ever imagine. Um, and also among the most mysterious, their morphology and their possible habits were at that time certainly not easy to understand, and, and nor were they intuitively understood the way, let's say, a theropod would be. Obviously, a theropod like a T. rex has to eat meat. But in the case of a sauropod, um, it was not immediately clear why the they looked the way they did, why they became so uh, incredibly huge. And uh, it's only recently, within the last, oh, I would say, at least to me, um, if Matt would agree, maybe uh, 15 to 20 years that so many pieces have come together that allow us to understand why they became the way they were. And you'll find if you read the book that uh, there is definitely uh, plenty of disagreement to go around about uh, what they were doing, why they were doing what they did. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I believe that Matt and I uh, came to the conclusion that they were a unique package deal, if you want to call it, of characteristics that uh, were evolved in order to handle the kind of vegetation and the way they processed vegetation. And along the way, they acquired some very uh, amazing distinctive characteristics, uh, which has been the subject of a great deal of math studies on the way they breathe. Yeah, just to follow up on that, I would say that certainly when I was growing up and even in, as I was starting my professional career in the late 90s, you know, we sort of knew what the other dinosaur groups are doing. We knew that hadrosaurs and ceratopsians were doing fairly sophisticated chewing and oral processing of their food and that they lived in herds, and uh, they were social, and we knew that at this time, you know, we're finding hadrosaur nests. We had a pretty good idea of their life history. And sauropods are sort of this paradox, because on one hand, they're the most familiar dinosaurs. They're the iconic dinosaur, sort of like your Sinclair dinosaur silhouette. Everybody can recognize a sauropod. Mm -hmm. But why do they have such little heads? Um, <laughs> why are they shaped the way that they do? There's a great quote from Walter Coombs from a paper from 1975 that we actually have in the book near the end, where he says, you know, they look like bits from lots of different animals stuck together. Hmm. What are we to make of this assemblage? And really, it's just in, like Mark said, probably the last 15 years that different lines of evidence from different research groups around the world have kind of led together, and there's been a synthesis that we feel like, okay, now we understand why sauropods were able to be successful looking the way that they did, and we understand a bit of the forces that basically constrained them to look the way that they did. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a number of chapters, it seems, that you go over each specific body part and, and then, of course, the skeletons and the muscles and down to, I, I think you got the digestive system, the respiratory system, and, and how all of those factors basically, yeah, informed how they looked. <laughs> yes. Well, evolution is a funny thing. It is not a predetermined process at all. In other words, if you could uh, repeat Earth history from the very beginning, you could seriously question whether many of the more well-known prehistoric clades or types of uh, creatures would have come about. And uh, Matt makes a very eloquent point in the very um, uh, end of the book, which I really liked very much. In the um, series that was um, uh, done on BBC about uh, life that might uh, follow the present life on Earth, the question would be, well, suppose you could maybe have something like gigantic tortoises that uh, <laughs> had stumpy sauropod legs and uh, somewhat long necks. Well, couldn't they become, with millions and millions of years, something like sauropods? And the answer would be no, because they their physiology was quite different and would not have permitted them to evolve along the same lines as sauropods. So there's a great deal of um, randomness as why uh, some things became the way they were. But uh, sauropods definitely responded to a set of circumstances in their own way. And our book gets into that quite a bit. And then also we introduce the um, major kinds of sauropods, which I think people would be surprised to know they were certainly not simply one particular morphology. Yes, they all tended to have large elephantine bodies, uh, columnar <laughs> legs, long tails, long necks, and small heads. But there was a tremendous amount of morphological variation and probably behavioral variation that went on in these animals. So we try to um, show people this in our uh, little section called 
a sauropod field guide. And uh, I think people would be amazed at how many kinds there were. And also that there were so many different uh, sizes. There were not only gigantic sauropods, as you'd expect, Mm -hmm. but actually very, very small to even tiny island outcasts that adapted to the limited resources of some of the islands in the uh, ancient area of Europe. On Hatag Island, there were uh, sauropods that were only as big as very large cattle, let's say a Holstein cow, in body mass. (laughs) And uh, there were also uh, other small sauropods that had very bizarre vacuum cleaner-like heads. They were quite different <laughs> from the uh, ways we uh, envision sauropods now. So there is actually within the group a tremendous uh, morphological variation that I think is quite fascinating. Mark and I have similar sensibilities when it comes to wanting to make uh, things as accessible as possible uh, for people. And we wanted both of us wanted the book to be you know, packed with interesting things to look at. There's hardly a spread in the book that doesn't have a photo or an illustration. Mm -hmm. But we also came at it from slightly different strengths and perspectives. So I am an anatomist. And certainly Mark is an an exceptional anatomist, as you can tell by looking at his art, including the diagrams in the book. But also he has much more of an interest and a feel for things like ecology. So there's big swaths of the book, basically everything to do with Mesozoic plants. Mm Mm-hmm. And a lot of the ecological stuff, the predator-prey interactions, sort of how organisms are interacting with the world. And I am more, how physiologically are they getting things done? And then when it came to diversity, I'm more interested in what makes them all the same. So are they all constrained to be big four-legged animals with long necks and long tails? They don't seem to have ever broken out of that. Mm -hmm. Where other dinosaur groups were doing lots of different things, lots of different shapes, lots of different sizes. Sauropods seem trapped in this big cow up to whale sized, you know, none of them ever got very small. None of them ran very fast. None of them went in the water or up in trees. They always look like sauropods. So there's diversity, but there seems to be walls around it that they couldn't break. Mm -hmm. And that to me is fascinating because all animals all the time, all organisms are varying in all directions. So if you don't see them evolving in different ways, usually it's because those options aren't ecologically viable. Something's killing them off. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. It really is. Yeah, that is that's a very good point. And um, one of the things that we did uh, take readers on were uh, hypothetical journeys in time and geography uh, to different areas on Earth in which there were major sauropod-dominated uh, ecosystems. And by dominated by sauropods, I mean that sauropods probably played a major role in shaping the environment, just as we hear about with uh, African elephants helping to shape the East uh, African savanna today in areas like the Serengeti by doing things like pruning uh, trees by their constant cropping Mm -hmm. and keeping certain environments open. Well, sauropods probably performed very much uh, that kind of function. So they're extremely important, what we call keystone species in terms of uh, dinosaur communities. So uh, I have to add, I've been thinking about this actually since you mentioned it, Matt. Earlier you were talking about how sauropods have such small heads. <laughs> Can we talk about that? Oh, like, yes. why, why did they have such small heads? <laughs> so if you look at all of the other big herbivores on land, whether they're mammals or dinosaurs, for dinosaurs you've got horned dinosaurs and um, duck bills for... Mammals, you've got elephants and big rhinos, giraffes, things like that. Other than the armored dinosaurs, all of the rest of those things don't just chew their food. They chew it pretty extensively, whether they're using scissor-like motion of the jaws like ceratopsians Mm -hmm. or they're doing more grinding like hadrosaurs and elephants and rhinos. There's some really interesting work that came out of Martin Saunders' research group in Germany They're the giants whose shoulders we stood most directly on in writing the book Mm -hmm. because in the 2000s and early 20-teens, that research group did just a tremendous amount of research, not only on sauropods, but also on living animals, trying to put together the synthesis on sauropod biology. And some of the research that they funded on extant animals, on living animals, was fascinating, including digestibility studies. Hmm. It makes sense that the smaller a particle of food is, the faster you can extract the nutrition from it. And that goes in the other direction as well, which is 
the larger a particle of food is, the longer you need to digest it. But digestion time also just goes up with body size. Right. <laughs> By the time you're a sauropod, it's going to take two or three days for food to get through your digestive tract anyway, mm -hmm. just because that's how long it takes when you've got intestines that long. <laughs> when you're at that level of retention time, when food's going to be in your digestive tract for three days, the effective particle size that you can completely digest is now up to the size of a leaf or a pine needle. So at that point, you can stop chewing and have no loss of digestive efficiency. <laughs> If you or I stopped chewing, our digestive efficiency would go way down, mm -hmm. and we'd be passing lots of undigested material. And for sauropods, that was no longer the case, because it was intersection of size and digestive physiology. So at that point, you can stop chewing. Once you can stop chewing, then you can get rid of these big, heavy teeth. The skull of any big herbivore, a rhino, a, a hippo, a, an elephant, a cow— Mostly they're a fiction. It's lots and lots of air spaces basically to support the brain, which is not huge, and the teeth, which are really huge, really heavy. The teeth are the bulk of the mass of the skull. If you can get rid of those teeth, then your head can be very light, and now you can do other interesting things with your head, like you can stick it on the end of a 40-foot long neck. <laughs> you couldn't put a rhino head on the end of a 40-foot neck because the neck would have to be – improbably large to make that work. And muscular to support it, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so sauropods, one of the trends that we see repeatedly in sauropod evolution is different groups cutting down their number of teeth until essentially they're just left with what would be incisors in us. And all they're doing is taking bites and swallowing. Chewing releases you from a constraint in another way as well, which is elephants, modern elephants, have to spend about 12 hours a day eating. Mm -hmm. And... A lot of that time is chewing. So maybe that's six or eight hours of taking bites, but then it's the rest of the time they're chewing before they swallow. Well, if you stop chewing, now you can just take bites for 12 hours. And you can pack a lot more calories in. And you can actually fuel a much larger body, even if you're doing things like fast growth, which we know sauropods were doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not only can you take one more per unit time, but now you can put your little head on the end of a long neck and reach up and reach out, you know, Forests not only go up, they can also be dense. They can also be mechanically sort of challenging environments. And putting a small head with a big mouth on a long neck lets you sort of exploit that. So sauropod heads were small, but they're basically on mouth. They're like Pac-Man or Cookie Monster. Mm -hmm. They've got a flip-top head. <laughs> so one of the talks I give on sauropod biology is titled Flip-Top Heads, Air-Filled Bones, and Teenage Pregnancy – how the largest dinosaurs got so big. <laughs> that sounds like a good talk. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Matt's mentioning of uh, fast growth and teenage pregnancy go hand in hand because these also were factors in the success of sauropods. Other dinosaurs, of course, were uh, and did uh, feature fast growth. However, fast growth was uh, something that was probably really vital to sauropods because in order to achieve the digestive efficiency that Matt has uh, clearly outlined to you, it was important to be able to get big fast. Mm -hmm. And also uh, to get big fast made you less likely to be eaten yourself. So if you could grow up really quickly in the matter of uh, a bird or a mammal, then that would ensure the most greatest likelihood that you would survive in order to um, achieve the efficiency that you needed. And this, in turn, allowed you to be much more likely to survive to reproduce your own genes. It allowed them to be able to produce many more young during their lifetimes than, let's say, a large a um, mammal like a rhino or a hippo or an elephant would be. Just to illustrate this, if you can imagine if we went on an animal planet um, helicopter and looked down on the Serengeti, if you if you saw a given elephant herd, you would probably have um, maybe, say, maybe 80 to 85 percent full adults, another uh, percentage of given percentage maybe sub-adults, and then a very, very few young Okay, it would be exactly the opposite if you were to go back in time, let's say, to the Cenomanian and look down 
on a particular uh, sauropod herd, most of the sauropods would be rather young individuals. They would be perhaps uh, very small juveniles, quite a few reproductively active sub-adults, but very, very few fully mature large adults. It would be exactly the opposite kind of situation. So um, this was the way it was, and it served uh, both sauropods and other dinosaurs very well to be this way, to be able to maximize their reproductive potential. Hmm. The bigger egg layers get, the more eggs they lay. So, you know, a little turtle like a box turtle uh, or a slider might lay somewhere between half a dozen and a dozen eggs, but a big sea turtle might lay two or three hundred. Ostriches lay more eggs per female per year than any other bird. Hmm. So that same scaling works for them as well. For sauropods, we think, based on the size of sauropod eggs, and which weren't that big, smaller than elephant bird eggs, uh, like maybe soccer ball size at the very top end, quite a few of them were much smaller than that. There's no way that just a handful of those eggs was the total reproductive output for a female for a year. So we think most sauropods are probably laying dozens to hundreds of eggs every year, mm-hmm. not all in the same nest. You can't afford to stick that many egg that many buried eggs in a nest. We have several lines of evidence that sauropods buried their eggs. Sometimes we find the nest actually scooped in the ground, and there's uh, there's some other clues like the porosity of the eggshell. Mm-hmm. Eggs that are buried have to have bigger pores to get enough oxygen in because the eggs have to breathe as well. Mm-hmm. They have to do gas exchange, get the oxygen and the carbon dioxide out. If you're on the surface, you can't afford to have big pores because you'll dry out. But if you're buried, drying out isn't the problem, suffocating is. That's one reason why you can't stick a ton of eggs in a single hole Mm -hmm. if they have to breathe is because the ones towards the center of the clutch won't get any air Mm. and they'll die and they'll spoil the clutch. Mm -hmm. So we think that most female swear pods are probably laying lots of different clutches, spreading their annual egg production around lots of different nests, both as a way to for the eggs to be more viable and also possibly as a predator defense. Egg predation is a huge problem for egg-laying animals. In some some uh, wild turtle populations, the annual recruitment of babies into the population is zero because oh. 100% of the nests get found and destroyed by egg predators Jeez. like raccoons and things. So why didn't they stick around and guard the nests like, uh, like alligators and crocodiles? Crocodilians practice pretty extensive parental care, even – you know, hanging out and having basically crocodile daycare uh, sometimes <laughs> after the babies come out. Mm-hmm. So, in fact, when we found out that dinosaurs were hanging around their nests and taking care of their babies, that shouldn't have been a surprise. That should have been the default assumption mm-hmm. since their closest living relatives, birds and crocs, both do that. Mm. But sauropods are the odd ones out. Sauropods didn't do that. As far as we can tell, once they dropped the eggs, they had nothing more to do with the offspring. Mm. One way can, we can tell that is by looking at the pattern of the nests on the ground. So if you think about something like a seabird colony or penguin colony, all of the nests are going to be about the same distance from each other, and they're going to be very evenly spaced. But if you look at the pattern of, say, sea turtle nests on a beach, they're going to be completely random. Sometimes you'll have two nests almost right on top of each other. Other times you might have 40 or 50 meters between nests, and it's not going to look like any sort of pattern whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And sauropod nesting grounds, and we have some, particularly in Argentina, they fit the sea turtle model, not the sea bird model. Mm-hmm. So it very much looks like they're dropping the nest. They're just wandering off. But in a way, this worked for them because all of the resources that other animals have to put into parental care, sauropods could just plow into making more eggs. So I really think it was sort of a predator saturation strategy where on hatching day, I imagine the ground just boiling with all these little monsters coming up through the, <laughs> through the soil thousands of them and you know they're the size of rabbits they can't run very fast they've got no horns no claws they're basically just mcnuggets on legs <laughs> um and i imagine a you know allosaurs and you know whatever's around just stuffing themselves <laughs> i imagine allosaurs sort of lying on the ground watching wistfully as the last few baby sauropods make it into the woods and just being too stuffed to go <laughs> follow them <laughs> And yet this is a uh, very basic strategy for egg-laying animals to employ. Uh, You just saturate uh, the landscape with so many young that the predators can't possibly eat them all Mm -hmm. with the assumption that at least a few of them, uh, a few of the babies are going to get through and be able to reproduce. Mm -hmm. That's interesting, though, thinking about 
how many different types of sauropods they were and the time that they spanned and living in so many different places and yet they all seem to not care for their young and, and do this strategy. Yeah, it's pretty – it's it's super weird actually for dinosaurs because <laughs> right out of the gate in the Triassic, it seems that most dinosaurs were practicing pretty extensive parental care and sauropods mm-hmm. are the one group that went in a completely different direction. But then most other dinosaur herbivores are chewing their food. Sauropods went in a different direction there. So there's lots of different places where all the other lineages were going and doing one thing. And sauropods sort of struck out in a different direction. But it seems to have paid off for them. You know, with the other groups of dinosaurs, they're exploring lots of different sort of ways of making a living. And, you know, different groups are rising and falling. But sauropods, despite the diversity that they did have, if you stood back, say, 200 feet from the very first sauropod that ever existed and the very last sauropod that ever existed, you'd probably have a hard time telling them apart. Hmm. Under the hood, inside, things like the shape of their teeth and with you know specifics of the, the muscles in their limbs and uh, their physiology and how much air they had in their skeletons, all that sort of skin-in stuff had had some changes. But from the outside... They're all a big body on four legs with a long neck and a long tail in a way that doesn't seem to have ever needed very much tinkering with. Mm -hmm. It was a very successful formula. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it's interesting interesting to me that that no other thing has ever done that. No. You know, like we look up ichthyosaurs and they look pretty much like sharks and pretty much like dolphins. (laughs) So if you want to be in the water and you're not going to be a fish – uh, you're probably going to end up looking something like that. <laughs> really nothing out there is doing what sauropods did. Probably the closest thing would be something like an ostrich or an elephant bird or a moa, where they're either in a situation where they don't have to deal with predators or getting big enough that they can sort of handle their predators or run away with from them. I guess that's probably the biggest difference between something like an ostrich and something like a sauropod is ostriches can just run mm-hmm. and sauropods were probably more on a track to just get so big that they couldn't be messed with. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And sauropods, in addition to their size too, probably had uh, a number of the defenses. Uh, One of the most obvious would be that enormously long tail, which in many species actually probably in mass was the equivalent of what their most likely uh, predatory species was like. So also sauropods, I believe, maintain the ability to rear bipedally throughout their evolution. And so they could certainly have used, uh, in many cases, the really uh, wicked-looking thumb claws that they had on their forefeet. Mm -hmm. So uh, they weren't uh, just pushovers. So um, one of the uh, chapters that we have in it uh, discusses the idea of um, defense in sauropods, the predator-prey relationships that went on. And based on what are what is known of modern creatures, there are probably a lot of options that sauropods had, and that there were a lot of countermeasures that their uh, theropod predators had too. So this makes for quite a fascinating story. Yeah. At the end of the book, I liked how it kind of wraps up with well, we still have these unanswered questions, and there's still yes. a lot we we don't know, and and some of these questions they were also. Bigger picture questions. I think one of them is like, why did non-avian dinosaurs go extinct when other animals didn't? So it's not just sauropods. The specificity of the in Cretaceous extinction is interesting in that, okay, you know, pretty much everything on land over maybe 10 kilos died. That's going to knock out sauropods. But there were other lineages of non-avian dinosaur that were underneath that size Mm -hmm. cutoff. Why didn't they make it when mammals and birds did? That gets into issues that I frankly I know less about because as a sauropod worker, I don't have to deal with them. It's obvious why sauropods died. Um, <laughs> as soon as you have the impact and the impact winner, and we're getting more information about that all the time. I just saw some interesting talks at uh, another conference in uh, Europe earlier this fall dealing with what the world was like after the impact. And it was dark for a while, long enough to crash the forests. And once the forests go down, you're going to lose the sauropods probably first yeah Mm -hmm. baby sauropods to me are a mystery because all this stuff that makes sauropods work 
works really well once you get to maybe five or ten tons, and from <laughs> then on up you're golden. But almost none of this stuff works very well when you're at you know five or ten kilos and you've just popped out of the egg. <laughs> mm-hmm. So those first, you know, probably even under the most optimistic rapid growth models, it's probably taken them on the order of like two or three years at least, maybe four or five, to get up to the five ton threshold. What were they doing? We know they weren't mm-hmm. running with the herds because we don't find their their tracks. Sauropod trackways are super interesting because usually the smallest tracks in a sauropod track site or mega track site are about a third the size of the largest. Hmm. So from one third grown on down, those guys aren't moving with the herd. And interestingly enough, about a third of full size is where we think these a lot of these things are starting to become reproductively active. So you get to a third of full size. Now you can keep up with the herd. You can go start pumping out eggs. <laughs> But up until you get to that point, are you just hanging out in the woods, hoping not to get eaten? <laughs> we don't know. We don't find very many sore baby sauropod fossils. And they have to be eating a lot, too, in order to grow so quickly. They have to be eating a lot. They oh, have to very much a, so. a significant impact on the, on the environment. And like Mark was describing earlier, if, at every level, there have to be more younger individuals than the next level up. It has to be a very, very broad pyramid. But we don't find very many of their fossils. I suspect that's because if you're a baby sauropod, you have one of two fates. 99% of the time, you're getting rendered into theropod poop. And (laughs) 1% of the time, maybe, you're going to grow into an adult. And so you're not going to leave any bones behind as a baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I got an interesting perspective into this recently because I have a kitten. It's now about five months old. And we just got the kitten its rabies shots. I was talking to my vet about this, about why the rabies vaccine wasn't given earlier and he said there's no point in giving the rabies vaccine to a little baby kitten because one people usually aren't putting them outside and two if they are kittens don't get rabies because if a kitten gets bitten by a rabid animal it dies Mm -hmm. and so there's just no survival potential there so i think baby sauropods are sort of in that kitten dilemma either a kitten if it encounters a rabid animal either it dies and probably gets eaten Mm -hmm. or it grows up into a cat. Um, replace rabid animal with any predator, and now you've got the f- possible fates of baby sauropods get eaten or grow up. But there's not very many other ways out, apparently. Interesting. I hadn't thought about that at all. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Especially uh, traveling in herds in the trackways. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting how many lines of evidence we can draw on things that you wouldn't that wouldn't have first occur to you, and then you're like, oh, hey, yeah, actually, that tells us something useful. Mm-hmm. But also, just when they reach the certain size or age, they just know to go find, they know where to go to find their herd. (laughs) Well, that's a really uh, fascinating uh, mystery as well. We do discuss that in um, our chapter about growth and growing up. And um, among other factors with uh, certain modern animals uh, like gorillas, baby animals they don't simply acquire the gut or microflora or fauna that they require in order to uh, digest certain foods. So in some cases, babies actually eat the uh, feces or poop of their parents uh, to acquire this sort of stuff. It's very similar to the um, immunity that's acquired by a baby going down the vaginal canal that it wouldn't normally get if it was to be born by cesarean section, Um, it has to actually come in contact with the adults that possess these things in order to acquire them. Hmm. So uh, baby sauropods probably at some point did have to begin associating with with older adults. And uh, it also probably provided them with um, models of uh, the type of vegetation that they would later uh, come to uh, adopt as their own food source. Baby sauropods, of course, even though they had relatively long necks, certainly couldn't acquire the same kinds of um, plant foods, uh, arboreal foods that um, adults could. And uh, this is another fascinating area of research. Uh, Carol Gee has done a lot of work in this area. Carol is a researcher into paleobotany. And she, uh, for example, has found out that um, in the American Midwest during the late Jurassic and the Morrison Formation, 
there were probably substantially greater uh, stands of uh, conifers um, that uh, that existed that uh, we believe formed the major food source for sauropods. So this would not only uh, provide the kind of food that adult sauropods would need, but it also poses a mystery. Uh, what were the babies eating? Well, one thing we know that they probably were eating just um, by inference were things that were high in uh, caloric value, like uh, horse tails or scouring brushes known as equisetum. Mm -hmm. And um, these are very high in uh, nutritive value. Babies could have used them to hide in, but also they probably, along with certain other plants that grew uh, taller, uh, provided them with the kind of nutrition they needed until they were able to reach the kind of heights where they could access certain other nutritious uh, kind of plant foods. So this is a very uh, fertile area of research. And so um, one thing that would be really great uh, would be if we could find, let's say, a preserved skeleton with uh, phytoliths or um, or plant uh, uh, support structures made of silica uh, in amongst the uh, bones of the abdomen or between the teeth. This could really tell us a lot about what uh, young sauropods, baby sauropods were eating as well as the adults. So this is a very uh, fascinating area of future research. Yeah, definitely. So I have to ask, do either of you have a favorite sauropod? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> do you want to go first on that, Matt? I bet I think I know what Matt's going to say, so I'll let him go first. <laughs> <laughs> I have two answers, and the first one isn't very modest. Um, my first <clears> love <throat> is Sauropod Poseidon, which is the first one that I worked on. And uh, and the first dinosaur, the first dinosaur, the first project, the first research of any kind, basically, mm -hmm. uh, that I did. We didn't know that it was going to be a new animal when we started working on it. The original idea was to just do a one or two semester project and try to kind of get like a family level identification. But after a semester was over and I'd sunk six months of my life into this, about that point, we realized, hey, this is a new animal. And then it was three more years of work um, at that point, because if you think you have a new dinosaur, you really want to be sure. You don't want to screw up and mm -hmm. name something that's already been named. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So Sorpsiden was my first love, but uh, as time goes on, I have a sneaking fondness for Apatosaurus <laughs> because it is oddly unsauropod like in that most sauropods are trying to be uh, sort of uh, gracile and lightly built. Their vertebrae are really lightweight. They're full of air. And Apatosaurus had air sacs, and it had, you know, some of those physiological things, but it's going hard in the opposite direction. Its limb bones are really thick. Hmm. It's built like a linebacker, and <laughs> it's not immediately obvious why that is. So it's it's a bit of a mystery. I think it was probably some sort of combat thing, probably intraspecific. More on that in the future. we got a paper in the works on that. But just the as I've spent a lot of time looking at looking at a patasaurus and thinking about it, it's just so bad. Mm -hmm. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look out so, for your yeah. paper. Yeah, it was well. It was, it was an, an amazing um, sauropod for sure. I'm curious and, to hear, uh, uh, hear Mark's favorite now. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, um, I I have to come in with Matt uh, a patasaurus, or uh, depending on which way you want to go nowadays, uh, Brontosaurus, which has uh, gained a reacceptance mm -hmm. depending on the expert you want to go with, uh, is certainly one of my favorites. It's one of the most unusual sauropod dinosaurs, uh, along with the other uh, diplodocids of that type uh, that evolved. And I just love its massive proportions. Like Matt, it had... Um, incredibly square boxy uh, uh, mid cervical or neck vertebrae that were quite unusual for even for sauropods and there's there's a possibility that's reading into this quite a bit but there's the possibility that uh, some of these boxy uh, uh, vertebrae had uh, callosities on them that were maybe used for actually aggressively knocking uh, through um, branches or or, um, or uh, twigs in order to get uh, to really succulent vegetation in the <laughs> case of some uh, Aracarian trees. So we really don't know. It's it's a possibility. It certainly could have been used for um, intraspecific combat between males, such as the way uh, giraffes often um, actually spar with each other by uh, by neck banging. However, then you have to explain, well, why did uh, presumably females have this too, unless they were doing that? Mm -hmm. So it's, to me, much more 
the likely that it was a, uh, a feature that had something to do with feeding. And feeding really, I think, uh, helps to explain a lot of why animals look the way they do. It's the first and foremost adaptation that an animal usually evolves in order to sustain itself. But uh, the other, my other favorite is Camarasaurus. I just love their chunky, boxy heads. <laughs> and the fact that their heads are so big for sauropods that you can really see a lot of detail in them. They're very nice subjects for an artist to be able to render. And that's probably why I chose that for um, <laughs> the cover on our book. Also, uh, Camarasaurus is among the very best known sauropods in terms of the completeness of its skeleton. Uh, it's one of the most common dinosaurs that we find in the uh, Morrison Formation. Uh, we we really don't know as to exactly how common they were, but they certainly seem to be found in great, much greater numbers than, let's say, uh, uh, Brachiosaurus or Apatosaurus slash Brontosaurus. So uh, they they were really neat dinosaurs, and they had um, uh, very massive, robust teeth that they probably were using to wrench tracts of uh, conifers off. So they probably were were very active feeders. Mm -hmm. But diplodocids are fascinating just because the skull is so extremely specialized in probably leaf raking, uh, getting mouthfuls of leaves and just raking them backwards and Mm -hmm. uh, stripping them off branches. So uh, they all were fascinating. But uh, yeah, those are those are two that I love very much too. For the cover, for the the camera source, did we know enough about these dinosaurs that you could create a pretty accurate depiction, or did you have a lot of le- creative leeway? Uh, well, I, I feel that uh, with camera swords, we, we do have uh, enough information to um, really certainly know what their skeleton was like. We have virtually 100% of the skeleton in some species like Camarasaurus lantus, which is the um, species depicted on the cover. Gregory S. Paul has done a landmark studies in uh, interpreting dinosaur anatomy. Going way back to the 1970s, he started doing very credible uh, reconstructions of uh, theropod musculature. And then, of course, went on to other dinosaurs, including sauropods. But basically, I uh, I feel that uh, Greg Paul uh, shows us the gold standard of dinosaur restoration. So I, I very much agree with that. The only thing I disagree with Greg and uh, a great many other dinosaur specialists about is the location of the nostrils and sauropods. Hmm. I uh, I actually think that they were, um, in some cases, they were very close to the anterior part of the skull, as we see with uh, uh, camera source. But with the diplodocids, I think that there was a very good reason why the nasal aperture was located so far up on the skull. I think it would have been much farther forward had there been a significant reason for uh, the dip had an anterior position. Mm -hmm. And um, this is one of my own little pet theories, and that is that uh, I believe that as sauropods got bigger and bigger, it became uh, much more difficult for them to bend down in any conceivable way, even if they waded into a water source to be able to get water. Um, So it would have been very difficult to have consumed or ingested water without uh, flooding the nasal cavity. So I think to make this possible, the nasal apertures uh, migrated farther up on top of the skull. Um, Serpods may or may not have had a tongue pump similar to certain chelonians or turtles, tortoises, to actually force the water backwards. So I think it was an advantage for you to, let's say if you were a long neck sauropod uh, that had to deal with blood pressure issues to raise and lower your neck would have been really a problem, a time consuming thing. And yeah, I think it would have been better for you, let's say, to keep your head far enough down in the water so that you could glug down water and keep your nostrils clear so that you could alternately breathe. Mm-hmm without doing that. So that's my reasoning. And of course, a lot of people would disagree with it. And I may very well be wrong, but that's <laughs> why I show the nostrils the way I do. So um, it's it's one of those fascinating things that we'll probably find out someday was either correct or incorrect. Yeah. So this is, uh, he's talking about the drawing on page 105, where uh, we actually illustrated it. He illustrated it both ways. And this is after the two of us went back and forth about this a lot because we actually are on opposite sides <laughs> yes. of this. It's a hot topic. <laughs> so here's how many mysteries there are to solve with sauropods. The authors of the book don't even agree on everything. Um, <laughs> and that's okay because science is a process of constantly revising what we think is going on in light of new information. There are certain lines of evidence that push 
a more anterior nostril position. There's other lines of argument that suggest maybe they're farther back. Mm -hmm. And we have suggestive information, but I don't think it's all locked up just yet. And to me, that's not uh, depressing. That's exciting. I don't want all the mysteries to be solved. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I want, you certainly don't. <laughs> I want tractable mysteries. I want, to be able, I want us to be able to make progress, but I always want there to still be some track in front of the train. Unfortunately, or unfortunately, with all the things that we're never going to know about sauropods, I think we're never going to run out of track, but that doesn't mean that we can't make progress. We have made a lot of progress in the last couple decades, and really that's what drove, I think, a big driver in both of us wanting to do this book is in going to the conferences, we knew that all this progress is being made from the public point of view, almost behind the scenes. Like a lot of this stuff was, you know, paleontologists were familiar with it. It was circulating in journals and in scholarly articles but it hadn't really made it out and penetrated into the popular consciousness yet. Mm -hmm. And so we realized that we were sort of at a felicitous point where we could take this flood of new science and package it in a way that hopefully made sense and bring it to the public in hopefully a very exciting way. Well, I think you did a great job, <laughs> personally. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Sabrina. Yeah. So. Where is the best place to find out more about each of you and what you're working on and say if you ever do a, a sequel to this book? <laughs> oh, well, Matt, why didn't you start off by telling them about your excellent uh, site? Well, thank you. Uh, sort of um, SVP so, so with uh, a colleague, Mike Taylor uh, from England, we started it 10 years ago. It's been going since October 1st, 2007. Congratulations. Um, so we just, just celebrated our 10th anniversary, which is kind of an eternity in the web. <laughs> yeah. Thorpod vertebrate picture of the week. It started as a joke. Uh, Mike and Darren Nash and I, we liked astronomy picture of the day. We realized we we're sitting on piles of tons and tons of uh, sauropod vertebra photos, which is, you know, we were all into them in one way or another. And we thought, okay, we'll, uh, we'll do this blog. And so our goal for the first, uh, first we just thought, okay, for a year, let's put up one fresh picture of a sauropod vertebra every week. And we actually maintained that, putting up a fresh new photo previously unseen at least once a week, sometimes more often, for two and a half years, at which point <laughs> wow. we had demonstrated that the concept was sound. Um, <laughs> and we decided, all right, we're not going to push ourselves that hard anymore because that actually was a chore, making sure that the blog was fed once a week for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And at this point, the blog has basically just evolved into Mike and Matt talk about stuff. <laughs> uh, Darren's gone off and had great success with his own blog, Tetrapod Zoology, and occasionally comes back for a guest post or something. But really, it's Mike and me having a platform to talk about whatever crazy thing we want to talk about. A lot of it's still paleontological. We're also very interested in open access and making sure that, that citizens can have access to the science that they're already paying for uh, with their taxes. Mm -hmm. We don't like scientific articles to be locked behind journal paywalls. We want them to be as, as accessible to everybody. And, uh, and we take care to make sure that our own papers are open and free to the world. Yeah, so, that's a great cause. Yeah, that's my pitch. Um, and now over to Mark. Well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, let me recommend um, my existing website at the moment. But the other, my personal website is being rebuilt, so no one should go there right now. That's uh, <laughs> it's really out of order. But the one I would recommend would be Artists for Conservation, all one word. dot org, and um, this illuminates my passion for wildlife conservation and how I combine this with paleo art, both in sculpture and uh, two dimensional. Uh, illustration as well as some of the projects i've been working on such as trying to determine the origin of tigers and other big cats so uh this is probably the best thing for people to go to if they want to find out more about uh, where i'm coming from great. great yeah that sounds really interesting and sabrina and i have been going to sv pow for quite a while so we're well acquainted <laughs> with that website <laughs> thank you sauropods are my favorite brontosaurus especially so Happy to hear oh, that. Oh, good. There you go. <laughs> oh, that's, that's a third vote. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much to the both of you. Uh, you had a great time. Well, it's so, so much of a pleasure to talk to both of you. Thanks so much, Sabrina and Garrett, for interviewing us. It was really a pleasure. Yeah, thank yeah. you for joining. Thanks for your kind words so and hopefully your interest can... in our work. Yeah. Thanks so much again, Mark and Matt. We had a really great time. And as I mentioned before, 
the sauropod book is one of my favorite books. <laughs> Not just because of sauropods, but because it's a good intro to dinosaurs, but also because it's about sauropods. <laughs> That's really what it is. Probably. <laughs> also really enjoyed the illustrations. <laughs> yeah, really good drawings for sure. <laughs> And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Apatosaurus, which was a request from Cole via Patreon, and also I figured we should be doing a sauropod for this episode. And how have you not done Apatosaurus yet? Oh, <laughs> uh, we focused on Brontosaurus and Camarasaurus, you know. Now we've got the trifecta. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so Apatosaurus was a sauropod that lived in the Jurassic in what is now North America, and its name means deceptive wizard. It was named in 1877 by Othniel Charles Marsh, who named the first known species Apatosaurus ajax. The Apatosaurus holotype was found in 1860 in Gunnison County, Colorado. Marsh gave Apatosaurus its name because of its chevron bones, which are similar to mosasaurs and not other dinosaurs. When this skeleton was being excavated and transported, its bones were mixed with another Apatosaurus specimen, which was originally actually described as Atlantosaurus immanis, so for some of those features, it's unclear if they belong to Apatosaurus or Atlantosaurus. Marsh said that the difference between Apatosaurus and Atlantosaurus was the number of sacral vertebrae. Apatosaurus had three and Atlantosaurus had four. Lots of Apatosaurus species have been named, as you can imagine, based on fragments. Marsh named many species during the <laughs> Bone Wars. So did Cope. Yeah. <laughs> So Marsh named Apatosaurus Ajax in 1877 after Ajax, a Greek mythology hero. The holotype is incomplete and it hasn't been studied as much as other species. Atlantosaurus Imanis may be a junior synonym of Apatosaurus Ajax, but again, it's confusing. Bones were mixed together, all that. Marsh named Apatosaurus Grandis in 1877, but then he reassigned that to Morosaurus in 1878, and Morosaurus is now considered to be a synonym of Camarasaurus. There's also Apatosaurus parvus, which was first described in 1902 by Peterson and Gilmore as Elosaurus, and then reclassified as Apatosaurus in 1994, and then in 2015 it was reassigned to Brontosaurus. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> There's also Apatosaurus minimus, which was originally described in 1904 as Brontosaurus by Osborne, and then Henry Mook named it Apatosaurus minimus in 1917. And then in 2012, Mike Taylor and Matt Wadle described material as Apatosaurus minimus. So that one's a little unclear. In 1957, Albert Felix de la Parent and George Zivesky named Apatosaurus alincorensis based on material found in Portugal. But in 1990, this was reclassified as Camarasaurus. And in 1998, it was renamed to Lurinhosaurus. In 1994, James Fila and Patrick Redman named Apatosaurus yanapin, which in 1998, Bob Barker made the type species of a new genus, Eobrontosaurus, and then Emanuel Shop reclassified that as Brontosaurus in 2015. Another win for Brontosaurus. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> William Holland named Apatosaurus Luisa A in 1916 based on a partial skeleton found in Utah. And for a long time... As many of you know, Brontosaurus was thought to be a junior synonym of Apatosaurus. And in 1879, Marsh named Brontosaurus excelsus. Elmer Riggs described a diplodocid found in Colorado in 1903, and he thought that where it was found was similar in age to where Marsh found Brontosaurus. And then Riggs compared the skeleton with Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus ajax and found that the holotype for Apatosaurus ajax was a juvenile, and that the features that distinguish Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus were not valid. Apatosaurus was named first, which is why Brontosaurus was thought to be a junior synonym. But then Bob Bakker argued in the 1990s that Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus were two separate genera, and Shop and others reclassified Brontosaurus as a valid genus in 2015, though not everyone agrees, and we go into much more detail about this in episode 100, where we got to interview Shop. Yeah, but I don't think anybody has formally disagreed and, you know, gone into the literature in a peer review publication and said, no, Brontosaurus doesn't count because of this, this, and this. So I think it's pretty much holding up. Yeah, I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> so the name Brontosaurus stuck around even when it wasn't considered a valid genus. It was always its own species, though. So it's not like 
you know. The excelsis part. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was, didn't go away completely. Exactly. It's just whether or not it's different enough to be its own genus. Yeah. But Thunder Wizard, come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, Elmer Riggs had published his findings in an obscure journal, so not many people knew about his conclusions at the time. And I mean, I talk to people all the time where nobody knows that history. Some people still think that Brontosaurus isn't actually real and or some never knew about the history. Mm-hmm. So Brontosaurus slash Hepatosaurus was the first sauropod skeleton mounted. It was specimen number 460, occasionally assigned to Apatosaurus, sometimes Brontosaurus. It was mounted in the American Museum of Natural History, and that one was found in 1898 by Walter Granger in Wyoming. The mounted skeleton was missing the head, feet, and parts of the tail, so Apatosaurus feet and parts of the tail found in the same quarry were used, and the skull was sculpted based on the, quote, biggest, thickest, strongest skull bones, lower jaws, and tooth crowns from three different quarries, Hmm. end quote which were probably from Camarasaurus, which was the only other sauropod at the time with known good skull material. And so that is how it came to be that Brontosaurus had a Camarasaurus head. <laughs> Slash the Potosaurus. Adam Herman oversaw the mount, and he sculpted a stand-in skull by hand. And Osborne said that it was, quote, largely conjectural and based on that of Morosaurus, which is now Camarasaurus. And the mount was labeled as Brontosaurus. Because the American Museum of Natural History was so popular, Brontosaurus became one of the most well-known dinosaurs. The name Brontosaurus is also used a lot in pop culture. It started with Gertie the Dinosaur, you've got the Lost World, and it's also the logo of the Sinclair Oil Company. It's Dino and the Flintstones, and it was a dinosaur stamp in 1989, which they defended that. All amongst it technically not being a valid genus at the time. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So... Anyway, back to the skull. Apatosaurus and Brontosaurus, but we're talking about Apatosaurus here, had a skull similar to Diplodocus, though for a long time it was thought to be similar to Camarasaurus. Its skull, though, was relatively small. There was an Apatosaurus skull found in 1909 in an expedition led by Earl Douglas in the Carnegie Quarry at Dinosaur National Monument. It was found near the Apatosaurus Louisae specimen, which was named after Louis Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie's wife. The skull was similar to Diplodocus. And Douglas and William H. Holland and other scientists thought that it was an Apatosaurus skull, but not everybody agreed, such as Henry Fairfield Osborne, who mounted the Apatosaurus skeleton with the Camarasaurus skull cast in the American Museum of Natural History. Anyway, Holland defended his view in 1914, but he did not mount a head on the Carnegie Museum skeleton. Possibly he was waiting for an articulated skull and neck to be found to confirm that it was the right skull. But then he died in 1934, and the museum staff put a Camarasaur skull in their mount. <laughs> Yale Peabody Museum sculpted a skull for their mount based on the lower jaw of a Camarasaurus and Marsh's 1891 illustration. In the 1970s, John Stanton McIntosh and David Berman redescribed Diplodocus and Apatosaurus skulls, and they found that a Apatosaurus skull was similar to Diplodocus, and that many skulls thought to be Apatosaurus were actually Diplodocus, so they reassigned some of those skulls. And then in 1979, the Carnegie Museum mounted the first true Apatosaurus skull. In 2011, the first articulated Apatosaurus skull was described. The specimen had similar cervical vertebrae as Apatosaurus ajax and different neck and skull features from Apatosaurus louisae. Mossberger found the first Apatosaurus ajax snout in 2013. Brigham Young University has a specimen with a well-preserved skull and skeleton and a preserved brain case, which was found in western Colorado. Apatosaurus has been found in the Morrison Formation in Colorado, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Utah. It was the second most common sauropod found in that formation. Camarasaurus was the first. The most complete Apatosaurus found so far is nicknamed Einstein. Hmm. (laughs) It turns out Apatosaurus may have been more solitary than other dinosaurs in the Morrison Formation. Other dinosaurs that lived in the same time and place include Allosaurus, Camarasaurus, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus, Carnivores, in particular, that lived in the same time and place included Ceratosaurus, Allosaurus, and Torvosaurus. Apatosaurus is part of the family Diplodocidae. Other dinosaurs include Diplodocus, Supersaurus, and Barosaurus. It's also part of the subfamily Apatosaurinae, which was named in 1929. And the only other genus in that subfamily is Brontosaurus. Apatosaurus had a stockier build than Diplodocus. 
On average, it was about 69 to 75 feet or 21 to 23 meters long and weighed about 18 to 25 short tons, though some were longer and weighed more. Apatosaurs had necks that were different from other diplodocids, and they may have used them for intraspecific combat. You know, Meaning? Between themselves. They had these paired spines, which gave them a wide, thick, and long neck and a deep chest. And there's a lot of debate over how flexible or inflexible the neck was. So some say Apatosaurus may have had an inflexible neck held horizontally to a slightly upwards angle. They may have, there may have been some niche partitioning so different types of sauropods could live together. A 2009 study argued that Apatosaurus may have held its neck high and had a flexible neck based on comparisons with extant animals, animals that are still living. There's been some debate over how Apatosaurus used its neck for feeding. Was it a high browser or a low browser? So Kent Stevens and Michael Parrish in 1999 and 2005 said that Apatosaurus had a wide neck range of movement. In 2013, Matthew Cobley and others said that it had limited neck movement due to large muscles and cartilage, and also that sauropods like Diplodocus may have moved their whole bodies to eat and may have spent more time foraging. However, Taylor found that Apatosaurus had a flexible neck. A 2013 study looked at the flexibility of ostrich necks, which are the most similar to sauropod necks, and they found that previous models of neck flexibility didn't account for soft tissues, so in the end, it's unclear how flexible and how <laughs> high Apatosaurus necks could be held. <laughs> On the tail side, though, Apatosaurus probably kept its tail above the ground for counterbalance. It had tall neural spines, and the tail was slender. They may have used their tails as a whip to create loud sounds. In 1997, Nathan Mirvold and Philip Curry did a computer simulation of an Apatosaurus tail and found it could make a whip-like sound of more than 200 decibels. The tail was probably too slender at the tip, though, so it couldn't hurt predators and be used as a weapon, and it may have been damaged if they used it for attack. That's an interesting comment, because the slenderness of the tip doesn't seem like much of a factor to me in terms of damaging, you know what I mean? It's like whips. I don't know. Seems it's like you still do a pretty good cutting at the end mm, with I don't, the thin tail. I don't have a tail. <laughs> I don't know. There's one Apatosaurus tail that's been found with a pathology, and this was caused by a growth defect. Apatosaurus, like many other sauropods, were originally thought to have been semi-aquatic, though people no longer think that this is true. They were definitely terrestrial. Apatosaurus was quadrupedal, with forelimbs being slightly shorter than hind limbs, and sauropod trackways show that they may have moved up to 12 to 19 miles or 20 to 30 kilometers per hour. Apatosaurus probably had a similar respiratory system as birds with air sacs in the neck, which would have helped also make their bones lighter. They may have had a warm-blooded metabolism. They had a large body mass with a relatively small surface area, which means the body had thick internal organs and the outer layers of tissue insulated the internal layers, so there would have been a high base temperature. And this may mean that Apatosaurus metabolism may have worked similarly to mammals. I've never heard that side of being warm-blooded meaning thick internal organs. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> Do your internal organs feel thick to you? I don't know, I guess. I mean, when you look at some animal, you know, like you look at a kidney or a heart, it does have pretty thick walls mm -hmm. and the muscles, but weird. <laughs> so another reason Apatosaurus may have had a warm-blooded metabolism is based on how fast juveniles grew. And as you know, like with many sauropods, they grew quickly, and then they became near full size around 10 years. This is based on a study in 1999. Thomas Lehman and Holly Woodward found in 2008 that Apatosaurus may have grown 25 tons in 15 years, peaking at 11,000 pounds or 5,000 kilograms in one year, based on growth lines and length to mass ratios. Another method with limb length and body mass found that Apatosaurus grew 1,150 pounds or 520 kilograms per year and reached full weight at 70 years old. So that's very different. Mm -hmm. But these estimates are not considered to be reliable since old growth lines would have been messed up by bone remodeling. Yeah, it's hard to count the lags in the sauropod bones. But I think they recently were pretty successful with the rib bones and they came to the conclusion that they're roughly around 30 so that agrees a little bit more with the first one. Mm -hmm. Either way, though, you're putting on multiple pounds a day, which is quite a bit of growing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hard to fathom what that would be like. Yeah. <laughs> so some specimens' ages have been estimated of Apatosaurus. Eva 
Grebeler and others in 2013 found that one specimen reached maturity at age 21 and died at age 28, and another reached maturity at age 19 and died at age 31. There's been a lot of juvenile potosaurs found. Juveniles tend to have shorter necks and tails and a bigger difference between the length of their forelimbs and hindlimbs. Uh, Potosaurus footprints were found in Morrison, Colorado in 2008 that indicated that juveniles could run on two legs, and I love picturing that. (laughs) That's pretty funny. (laughs) They had a claw on each forelimb and three claws on each hindlimb, and the claw on the forelimb may have been used for defense, unlikely though, based on the shape and size. It also could have been used for feeding. Most likely it was used to grab things like tree trunks when they were rearing up. A potosaurus was an herbivore, and it had chisel-like teeth, It was a general browser, and it kept its head elevated. It could probably eat 880 pounds or 400 kilograms of food per day. Oof. (laughs) Yeah. It had gut microbes to help them digest vegetation, and they may have swallowed lots of food without chewing. In 2014, there was a Brontosaurus hoax article going around that claimed that John Moore University in the UK cloned a baby apatosaurus nicknamed Spot and included a picture of a hairless baby kangaroo. (laughs) (laughs) And last, there's an Apatosaurus song by Storybots on YouTube. It's a kid's song, and it's not that scientifically accurate, but it's kind of catchy. One of the lines is, my neck's so long and so strong that I can't think of the melody right now. But we have a link in case you want to check it out. It's very much a kid's song. Yeah. Garrett did not like it. No. <laughs> <laughs> but if you like Apatosaurus, hey, it's probably the only song to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> and our fun fact of the day comes courtesy of a recent article by Caleb Brown in Peer J, where he talks about some of the different osteoderms and horns that Borealopelta had. And remember, that's that notosaur that was found in Canada, and it was preserved so well that not only are the bones preserved, but the keratin over the bones. So on the osteoderms, you can see how much keratin added on top of it. And we've mentioned before that claws on things like Allosaurus When you see the fossil and it's just the bone, there would have been a keratin sheath that extended quite a bit past that and was much sharper and things like that, which is what you'd actually see in real life. So the claws were a lot bigger and scarier in real life, in other words. And what Caleb was looking at with Borealopelta was trying to figure out, based on these bones, how the keratin relates to it so that we might be able to extrapolate that to other animals. But one complicating factor he points out is that in some modern animals, specifically bovidae, which is things like yaks and, you know, other bovines, (laughs) they have really similar horn cores, which are those bone parts, but the keratin does all sorts of different things. So with a similar horn core, so in other words, if it fossilized and all you had was the bone, you could have a straight horn that's pretty short, you could have a much longer straight horn, or you could have a horn that starts to curl and things like that. Huh. So when we see these little horns on some of these dinosaur heads and we assume like with Carnotaurus that it just had these little short horns, maybe it actually had like curving horns like or something. Like a mustache. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's above its eyes, but I guess. No, the curve I was thinking. Oh, mustache. The way you're gesturing your hands. Oh, I see. I was thinking like a yak, but I guess. (laughs) Yeah, so basically there's a lot of information still missing about what exactly the claws and horns would look like just from having these bone pieces. You really want to have that keratin, but unfortunately it rarely fossilizes. So it's hard to say. Like, what exactly a triceratops horn would look like? Would it be curving more or less and all those kinds of things? Cool to think about, though. Yeah. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. The last one of 2017. We gave you a nice long one. (laughs) (laughs) Next week, we're going to do a best of episode because I know those are always pretty popular. So we'll throw together some of our favorite news and dinosaurs. Yeah. And don't forget to subscribe to our show so that you don't miss out on any new episodes. Thank you again for being our listeners. It's been a really great year. We wish you a happy new year. Happy celebrations. Stay safe. And we will talk to you next year. If you want to join our growing community on Patreon, check out our page at patreon.com slash Thanks again and until next time. 
Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.